Good morning, Afghanistan! Yeah, I think we're going to start every show like that, at least this week, to celebrate the end of the American military occupation of Afghanistan. Coming to a rather ignominious end last weekend. Oh my gosh. So many headlines. We're going to be talking about this all week. I hate to do this again like two days in a row. We got a, we have an Afghanistan blog and we have a COVID blog. Yeah. Things are not going well for our president at the moment. Uh, a lot of interesting headlines today. We got a great guest. Alex Flores joins us representing the, I want to get the name right, First Nations Caucus. Is that it? Yeah. First Nations Caucus. Um, I hugely important. I mean, I, I, I have the same inclination in, in terms of, uh, like, I have to admit that it's a racist thought that I have when I want to like collectivize black Americans and say, how come you're not more libertarian when you've had such an horrific experience with government, you know? Uh, and then you go native Americans. Hello. Like, uh, a little, little worse, a little worse there. Uh, so that the movement is is growing into those demographics, uh, I think is is long overdue, and I would applaud Alex's work in this field. So it's very exciting to see that happen. I, in in celebration of the end of the war in Afghanistan, it, it was, that's not it. It's the end of the occupation, right? The end of the American military occupation. You want to call it the war if you have a, if you invade and occupy and then stop occupying? Is that invasion and occupation together the war i mean i don't like to think that like what i did in iraq was war i was there for like a city under siege even like i i earned a combat action ribbon in fallujah in 2004 but it wasn't war there was combat but it was it was within the context of an occupation it wasn't an organized force on force war of like a large group of people trying to kill another large group of people. Not quite. And definitely not on that scale. Anything that, that, that I experienced. So I'd be happy to say, no, I, I didn't go to war. I went to the occupation of Iraq in 2004 after the war was over. Because the invasion had been completed at this point. Joining us co-hosting today, we have, uh, we have an army veteran too, actually. Uh, well, we have uh, Jim and Ed, veterans co-hosting and producing the show today. Maybe they'll have something to weigh in on this. Uh, Steve will be, uh, we believe he's having technical difficulties this morning. Should be swapping with Ed for co-hosting on Thursday. The other veteran on our team and, and an, another Iraq veteran. And it's, it's not as personal for me as an Iraq veteran, but contextually my experience was very similar to, to many people of the American military troops who were deployed to Afghanistan in terms of you know, the, the experience of the occupation of, of that kind of war, so to speak. Uh, and and I, I suppose that if you are in Afghanistan, American military combat veteran, there's, there's got to be some soul searching going on right now. And it, 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 it's a very dominant cliche right now. I, not hitting this story too hard today, but close to the top of Drudge Report in their Afghanistan summary headlines, I was gold star mothers. Uh, but I, I should I should get it right. Uh, but the, the, even the VA, like I, I get emails from the VA and one of them today was uh, about Afghanistan, let's talk. And it, it's sort of just an undeniable thing about the VA's existence that when this happens, they kind of have to be there for the vets, at least symbolically, to say, hey, I know you guys are going to, you don't want to talk about this shit. You, saw, you, you, you thought we were going to win? You were still holding on to that? I mean, that's a big part of it that they're not, they're not really willing to, uh, or haven't been willing to face up to or admit about their own delusions until being faced with the reality of the end of the war. 
and it was not what a lot of you expected, was it? Although many of us of a libertarian understanding of government are not at all surprised. Uh, and and uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm a little bit surprised by how badly Biden screwed this up, so to speak. Um, and I do think there's a significant amount of manipulation, obviously, of resource control, of controlling, manipulating, directing government spending, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but even the powers that be, I think, would have an interest in this happening a little bit more smoothly. And by the way, uh, oh, the headline was Gold Star Mothers, Hearts Ache After Takeover. And if your child died in this effort that my friend Scott Horton describes in the title of his book as A Fool's Errand, describing the adventure in Afghanistan, you now have to admit at least the government screwed up so bad that your child's life was lost in vain. It's not just the end of a policy. It's not just uh, I, as, as, as much as, you know, I, I really like the, the way we talked about the pulling out a knife from a stab wound analogy you know it's yeah there's going to be some bleeding uh you better be there right away with some love and and sutures in terms of foreign aid uh muhammad saif uh on youtube comments you think the taliban can keep control of afghanistan for long questions like that are not the kind that i think are appropriate for speculation uh, by someone like me, or really by anyone who doesn't understand the exact peculiarities of the string pullers and the players involved in trying to predict whether the Taliban will be able to you know, hold the country or hold power in Afghanistan. If for some reason, like I, there are some obvious fears right now that I, I, I think don't really have to be stated so to speak but uh another false flag could be used as an excuse to completely re-engage in afghanistan that's what they'll call it re-engaging something like that <laughs> but i i don't try to make precise predictions beyond what I can predict with confidence. Uh, O'Donnell for Liberty, my platoon made it through Afghanistan with three purple hearts and no K. We lost seven in the year following to drugs and suicide. It wasn't worth it. And then there's all those people like you and all the parents of service members who have seen their children go through those experiences as well. So, uh, Justin, I'd love to have you call in today. Uh, we're going to go ahead and put the comp put in, uh, in the comments. Uh, wherever, wherever you may be watching, I don't know who's going to handle this, Jim, uh, or, or Ed, I'll ramble for an, another minute, get that out there. We really want to encourage, uh, or just at least invite, uh, any veterans, particularly will encourage veterans, if only for, for making the show better and more fun for me. Uh, I, I'm inviting, uh, any veterans, uh, to call in this week to talk about, uh, the, end of the occupation of Afghanistan and how that might be affecting y'all. Um, so we've got, there it is, uh, copy and paste this link directly into your browser to call in. Remember, you can call in, you can have your camera off, so it's just audio, can stay anonymous if you like. Uh, but I'll be keeping an eye on uh, my private chat with Jim during the show so that if anybody calls in uh, to talk about that, uh, really, I mean, you know, anybody who has any particular insiders affected by this, we're going to prioritize veterans. Uh, but hey, gold star mothers always go to the front of the uh, of the line there, right? Uh, so yeah, absolutely. And I, I don't mean to, uh, to to demean that experience by using that mocking tone, but that there is a sort of uh, mixed feeling for me in all of this about well, veterans are special now. 
No, we're fucking not. I mean, by our experience, by our insights, perhaps. Um, but it, this is a time for veterans' voices to be heard in general in the American conversation at the end of the occupation of Afghanistan. That we learn the lessons. We, America, learn the lessons of this war crime. Uh, I hesitate to call it a failure. It's not a failure. Look at how much money they made. The war and occupation of Afghanistan were extremely successful by the metrics of those architects of the policy. So with that, we do have some fun stuff as the title of today's show is uh, Taliban and bumper cars. We'll get to that in just a few minutes. But uh, what's that? Uh, we, we might have a caller, uh, but let's go ahead and get Jim for producer notes and bring Ed up here as co-host, and then we'll get to our caller. What's going on? Yeah, we got an OEF veteran uh, as the caller backstage, so we'll get to that. Hope you're ready for a good show, everybody. Our call-in shows are always fun. Hopefully we get some good content today, and we got a great guest planned for you. Uh, looking at t.me forward slash Adam versus Man. That's the public Telegram channel that everyone is welcome to join, so please... Uh, if you want to see, uh, keep up with any of the links as Adam's talking about them, or you just want to look at them from previous, that's the Telegram channel where you can find all the links for the show. Patreon.com forward slash Adam versus the man. That's where you can financially support the show. One, five, ten, even $50 a month are the packages. $10 a month is the sweet spot that will get you access to the private producers club, which is where we share links and discuss what's going to be discussed on the show. So if you want to be a part of the show in that way, Patreon.com forward slash Adam versus the man's best way to do that. Instagram at the garden of freedom is the handle to see all the pictures and videos of life up there in Gardenia. You can see the assault kittens uh, practicing their techniques there. It's an awesome page. Definitely a bunch of great pictures and videos. So visit Instagram at the garden of freedom. Uh, next we'll check out homefrontbattlebuddies.com. Uh, this is, a veterans nonprofit organization that is aiming to end the need for veterans, combat veterans in the first place. We'd like to know how they're going to do that. Read all about it on homefrontbattlebuddies.com and just know that all of your donations to that website are theft deductible. So that's definitely worth mentioning every single time. Uh, next, we run over to the crypto6.com. The crypto, the number six.com. The Bitcoin church that was raided up in Keene, New Hampshire. I'm sure you heard about. You can donate any cryptocurrencies you choose to. Uh, to their to their legal funds, or you can write to Mr. Nobody who's still sitting in a cage by this link right here. Do that via the crypto, the number six dot com. And next, we're checking out uh, gogreenenergyonline.com, the website we send everybody to that's thinking about doing it themselves and uh, wanting to learn more about solar panels, micro wind powers, just getting themselves zero energy homes. If you want to learn more about it and you want to get to doing it yourself, go greenenergyonline.com is the best place for you to start. Uh, I hope you have a great show, everybody. Let's get ready for our co-host. And just one more producer note, our good friend Justin O'Donnell is also backstage as a caller. All right, Ed, quickly, welcome to the show. Happy Tuesday. Coming from the uh, towers of Gardenia there, I see. Ed, before we get to our callers, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to get you back on. Mm -hmm. Uh, or even keep you on for the callers if you like. Uh, for we just have two stories about Afghanistan. Uh, I don't want to inundate with coverage or trying to get into the minutia of things right now. A lot of it is being very much distorted, uh, a lot of uh, things being misrepresented. And I think back to uh, the one of the major impetuses is that is it impetuses or impeti? Uh, impetuses for the uh, the first Gulf War was what turned out to be a completely fabricated story of Iraqi troops murdering babies in incubators in Kuwaiti hospitals, and it was it, it, it was horrific, inhumane, and horrific. And you go, well, if they're murdering babies in hospital incubators, well, we better we better murder every last motherfucker. Who, 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 like a mafia don? I want them dead. They're fair, but no. But it was it was all fabricated, and that's one of the ways we get misled. And I think a lot of shit coming out of Afghanistan right now is heavily distorted. So I don't want to try to pick apart, you know, understanding the exact texture of it. 
but uh, per perhaps larger meaning and direction and opportunity for those of us who care about ensuring that uh, we can prevent war crimes like this from happening again in the future, right? Uh, Afghanistan, short story, the security we provided was for the heroin we got. All right. Well, with that, Eddie, let's go to our callers. We'll bring you back in just a few minutes or uh, in between callers here. We got two lined up. Uh, let's go to Justin first since he was commenting earlier and uh, has been a regular in our comment audience lately. Justin! Hey, Justin O'Donnell of the Quill and the New Hampshire Libertarian Party. Uh, welcome to the show, sir. Hey, thanks for having me on. You want to uh, jump into it with your veteran credentials? Um, yeah, I, I served eight years in the Army National Guard, Massachusetts National Guard. I, throughout my political career, I've avoided talking about it uh, because I've seen so many people run for office on the platform of I'm a veteran, vote yeah. for me because I'm a veteran, and it's always really fucking pissed me off because uh, some of the most <laughs> incompetent people I've ever known we're veterans, <laughs> especially officers. Um, Ian, so that, that was something I never really wanted to campaign. I never wanted to do anything. Uh, but eight, eight years in the Guard um, with two tours, and it was the end of my Guard experience, which really ended up turning me into a libertarian, eventually turned me into an anarchist, which was domestic security missions in the United States. Uh, mm. it, it wasn't even the stuff we did overseas. Right. It was uh, domestic ops in the United States. And me and you have talked about that experience yep. in the past. Um, I, I really just wanted to harp on like what was going through my head yesterday. What 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 was happening yesterday? Uh, I got up be, before your show started. Started watching the news and um, seeing the images on the news of the helicopter landing on the embassy. Yeah, and like the instantaneous, like no hesitation thought to run through my head is like the fall of Saigon. I immediately grabbed a screenshot, put it on Twitter next to the picture from Saigon in 75. And I'm like, look, another loss for imperial imperialism, the empire falls. And then like, as like that tweet started to get traction, people started responding to it. It, it. it really started to hit me. I'm like, I had never thought, never even considered in my life, what Vietnam vets must have felt watching mm. the news of the fall of Saigon. Yeah. Um, and it was such a conflict. It was such like an emotional like turnover. At one point, like I actually had tears. I'm like, it, it's over. Like it, it's this, this is it. It's actually fucking over. Like, I don't, 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 don't be so sure. Right, Another but, false flag, just like that. And we, we have a, a resurgence or a re-engagement in Afghanistan. Uh, but I, Justin, one thing I got to interject, uh, that, that's a very positive note it, 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 that I take from the juxtaposition of the Vietnam veterans experience versus the global war on terror veterans experience is that for them, that was a real fucking war. Like, pretty much the whole time. Whereas for us in Iraq and Afghanistan, there were much more lower scale of violence in occupations. And that doesn't mean that the tragedy is any less significant when you lost a limb or a buddy or a family member or whatever the case may be. But it, the, the scale of the brutality is actually significantly less. And I, I, wanna, I wanna celebrate that. But holy shit, yeah, you think back to what Vietnam veterans went through. It's 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 almost like Nixon rose out, uh, up from the grave to tell Nix or to tell Biden, "You'll never end a war in a more spectacular failure than I did." And Biden said, "Yeah, hold my beer." Well, it, it, even more to that, it's even the popular sentiment like Vietnam vets came home to your baby killers. Nobody yeah. thought well, that war was justified. Um, that's that's a bit of a myth. That's I, I I I don't know if you've actually looked into the history on that, but that's generally overblown. Uh, the the spit on Vietnam veterans. There was it was it, it was it's generally much more exaggerated uh, in the mythology than it was in reality. It Sorry to interrupt. With that. Well, that's important. I think it was, it was, it was think, a way to demonize the anti-war movement. I think it was more the experiences related to me by the. Uh, old hags at my local VFW before I stopped going there uh, who came home to Boston and New York. 
Yeah. Which yeah, fair enough. Not friendly places, but like, and that's what stuck with me when I was watching the news yesterday was like, these people came home to popular sentiment being against the war. We came home and I'm the weird one who's against the war. <laughs> um, yeah, generally speaking, veterans were more anti-war than the general population. It's it's hard yeah. to objectively measure that, but you're right. To, it's really, ugh. Yeah, and, and even to this day, I still don't know what the proper response to thank you for your service is. Uh, like, it's one of the most awkward interactions I've ever had in my life. I, when, I, when I can't, so I like to, you know, I, I love talking with strangers and interactions and casually making people laugh and think. So when someone says that to me, I say, wait a second. You mean for serving bankers, politicians, and war profiteers? Come on, man, you know better than that. You know, kind of, make, you know, depending on the situation, you know, kind of make a joke out of it. And they go, yeah, yeah, I got you, bro. You know, it's, yeah. That's where you connect with people. Um, but no, basically the past 24 hours, I, I've been pissing people off on social media. Yeah. Old friends. Oh, just like... the last 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure. specifically people I never pissed off in the past. Uh, people yeah. I served with. And I'm seeing like old Facebook friends, like 50-50 down the middle, who are super pissed at Biden and, and think this is like a retreat and a surrender and like everything they fought for was meaningless. And the other half of the guys I served with are like, thank God, it's over. Like, yeah, <laughs> and, and my family even net my family's not big on the military, but like I have a couple uncles who are huge red hat magas who are like commenting and sharing news stories about all these gold star mothers who are talking about how it's a disgrace um because the news is trying to spin it for a redeployment um and how their sons deserve more. And I'm just going into the comments on these news articles. I'm like, sorry, but your son was a victim, not a hero. Like your son was just another victim of the banker's war for profit. Like there's yeah. nothing to be said here, but like creating more dead boys yeah. is not going to fix what happened. Yeah. I think one of the most important things we can do in our messaging framing around this issue is to never call this thing a failure. The invasion and occupation of Afghanistan were great successes by the metrics of the architects of those policies. The rich got richer, poor people died, rich men benefited from poor men dying because that's the racket that is war. And, well, and I'll I, tell you I, what, I, when, when, I Joe really Biden, when Joe Biden called it a failure yesterday, I almost jumped out of my seat like, holy shit. Uh, I, I, I saw the... Joe Biden will make an announcement at 4 p.m. Like, tune in. I'm like, all right, it's going to start again. We're going back. It's, it's a failure, but it's a failure that I can blame on somebody else. Well, he took blame at the end. He said he deserves his fair share for his time in the Senate as vice president, which blew my mind. He blamed the current stat, uh, issue on Trump, but said he took his fair share. He said the words, the past 20 years of nation building have been a mistake. And I was sitting there watching it like, I never thought I'd be cheerleading for Joe Biden. Like, never in my life would I think the architect of the prison industrial complex had the potential to say something right. You don't have to cheer for someone for conceding an unavoidable, you, right. you, like you know, a point that, that like it, it's it, he. If he said any, the, the reason he says those things, you know, you understand the nature of government that he's he's that front man. He's still just being that salesman, like. Do I give Trump credit for, you know, incorporating non-interventionism in his populism? No. It is that the, the, the paradigm and the people and the world and the, the human family have evolved to the point where no fucking way is militarism populist. No. I, I will say that the one thing that Joe Biden said that I think everyone needs to let stick with them, the one thing from his speech, which I think is critically important for everybody, even though supporting the, a re-intervention, those who are upset that we withdrew, is it doesn't matter when we did it, this result was going to be the same. Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, what I, I got one question for you. I want to yep. pick your mind on here as an activist and, and veteran and uh, someone who, b by your experience, is uh, passionately anti-war. What is the opportunity that the outsized spectacle of the withdrawal 
uh, has become. What 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 does that represent for us? To to is there a campaign here to say never again somehow? I think there is. I I I, I honestly think it's going to get worse before people start getting down that road. I think we're going to see some kind of strategic failure with this evacuation. Um, they're trying to evacuate 60 to 80,000 people from Kabul right now over the next two weeks. That's one hell of an undertaking. Um, I, I think this might be the biggest evacuation since Dunkirk <laughs> mm. uh, post failure. And, uh, mm. We're already seeing people climbing onto C-137s and falling a thousand feet to their deaths um, because of how desperate they are to get out. And I, I think it's going to need to get worse before pe people and mass can look at it and say, "This was our fault. This was the fault of the United States government, the United States military, for creating this situation in the first place." And we can never let this happen again. Yeah, that last part is in we the people. Who let it happen, uh, Justin? Thank you so much for the call. Just uh, we we got another caller. We got to get to uh, AJ and OEF vet who wants to vent. Uh, anything you want to plug real quick before we go? Ah, uh, no, man, it's your show. I don't want to plug too much. Uh, it's important issues you're talking about. And all what's, my what's your Twitter? What's you your Twitter? Follow, at least? You can follow me on Twitter at O'Donnell four N H. You can catch my current beef with Marianne Williamson as she's insisting we send troops back to protect women's rights. <laughs> <laughs> I, I triggered the hell for last night. I, I liked. I liked Marianne Willie. What the fuck? Okay, thank you for. Oh my gosh, uh, that's that's like all I need to know about that Twitter drama. Thank you so, again for the call, Justin. Everything you do for the yeah. cause. All right, let's get AJ up here. We have another caller, an OEF vet, who wants to vent. AJ, welcome hey, to the show, Adam. How, how you doing, man? Excellent. I guess it's 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 a bit big mixed feelings for me this week. I mean, I'm doing all right, but it's like, oh man, uh, I I get to be right about a lot of shit, but god damn, it sucks sometimes to be right when you knew that this kind of uh, painful withdrawal was coming. You want to delay? You want to? You know, what was that? I was just saying, are, are you on a delay? I guess so. Uh, it's okay. I understand if you're driving. Looks like you're 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 uh, on the job. But do you want to start with giving us your military resume? Oh no, we lost the connection. Well, AJ, if there's any way that you can hear us, uh, if you can pull over, find a consistent connection, we'd love to get you on for a few minutes here uh, before we get to our guest in 30ish minutes. But let's get Ed back up here for our two headlines about Afghanistan that I think these are just sort of like, I feel like we did enough. It's it's like COVID. I don't want to talk about Afghanistan headlines for 30 minutes a day for the next two weeks. Cause we could do that. You know, it's sort of like COVID. You have to make sure that the dosage is correct, but I have, I have two fun headlines about Afghanistan that are like, tack ons to our sort of more comprehensive coverage from yesterday. Uh, Vice.com has this first one. Surreal footage appears to show Taliban militants driving bumper cars and lifting weights. In one clip, a group of men are trying out exercise equipment as one person holds a rocket launcher. Now, Ed, did, do, you, do you notice the problem with the, the language in this headline? I, I, I mean, aside from this, st 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 don't think about the story. Yeah, yeah, there's footage. There's real fucking footage of Taliban troops with rifles and bumper cars. Uh, but, but Ed, aside, put that aside for, for a second. What is, what, and, and, and Vice uh, used to be, I mean, it, it, I guess it's still technically in, independent media, uh, as as Vice dot com, but it's it's become so corporate and ideologically driven and sensitive uh, because it's gotten so big. It seems to be uh, writing an oddly mainstream pro militarist propaganda angle, deeply baked into the editorial slant of the language in this headline. Did you catch that? You know what I'm talking about, Ed. <laughs> You think? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you hit right on the those, nose, man. Those Taliban fighters? 
who are evil demons who we just spent 20 years fighting, bleeding into the sand. They are evil, inhumane robots and vermin and religious backwater cretins. How could they possibly enjoy things like exercise and bumper cars and it's fun? How could, how could they be human? How dare you suggest this this footage? It's it's not even real. It, it's surreal. And it, it doesn't show Taliban militants driving bumper cars. It appears to show Taliban militants driving bumper cars. Pretty, pretty sure that's what that is. Uh, yeah, I mean, you really, with I don't think this article, I, I think I, I read all of it. Uh, it's not like they're trying to deny the authenticity of you this. No, uh, yeah, not, yeah. You, you can't buy that kind of footage. <laughs> yeah, right. And I, I, I think the, the reason I present this, I, I think what's uh, very important as well for us to keep in mind with the framing of how we talk about what's happening in Afghanistan it, it, is that the Taliban is more representative of the Afghan people than the puppet U.S. government in Afghanistan. Okay. That's, and and I, I don't know that that's entirely true. And I'll bet you could argue that very subjectively one way or another, right? You could say, well, you, you give a, they forced civil rights in a certain... No. D death is not dying. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good civil right that the American military doesn't really... Uh, Respect very well, at least. So the next headline, and this is the second one. See, I think we have some chats here. What do we have? Um, all right, so we're, we're going to come back to this one, Ed. And, and I'm, I'm going to predict that these uh, – I mean, we're not going to be talking about bumper cars and lifting weights for forever. But we, right. this next headline is sort of <laughs> – this next headline is sort of the meat behind that. Taliban this is from the AP, APnews.com. Taliban announced amnesty, urge women to join government. The Taliban declared an amnesty across Afghanistan and urged women to join their government Tuesday, seeking to convince a wary population that they have changed a day after deadly chaos grip the main airport as desperate crowds tried to flee their rule. Following a blitz across Afghanistan that saw many cities fall to the insurgents without a fight. Why? Why would they? Why would they fall without a fight? Oh, I geez, because the I don't get it. I don't get it. I mean, it's an Islamic country, and they have no, you know, William women are are property, and I, I don't get what they're doing. No, I, I don't get it. And and so so the press, the mainstream framing of this is, uh, the Taliban have sought to portray themselves as more moderate than when they imposed a brutal rule in the late '90s, but many Afghans remain skeptical. Not so skeptical as to defend their rule by the U.S.-sponsored puppet government against the marching Taliban. No, and and I, one of the things that that I want to say as a sort of premise to any of my analyses about what's, or, or commentary on what's going on in Afghanistan is that I am very open to the possibility that we are going to find out over the next few months some major revelations about the manipulation going on in Afghanistan right now. And there's going to be, uh, it's being talked about in the meme wars, I think more than anywhere else, that uh, the U.S. military really armed the the Taliban or the, the, a lot of the, the weaponry that is being used right now came from U.S. tax dollars one way or another, no shit. And it's, that... It's just another way to get you to stop talking about COVID or anything they're doing to the people. It's a more hype distraction so you're not... You know, you're not watching what's being done to you, you know. Afghanistan is just a movie in front of you while they're pounding it to you behind you. So if if this is sort of a big spectacle of distraction in a way that they're letting it happen this clumsy, right? What are the, what, what is the right hand doing while we're watching the left hand? Don't know. Don't know. Getting only, ready for another COVID can, resurgence? Can only imagine. I mean, everything I'm seeing is is they're they're giddy with power. The the right is giddy with power because they're expecting to overwhelm the House and, and the Senate in 2022. 
you know. So it's, I don't want to. I I don't want to judge this very subjective concept that the concept of the U.S. sponsored Afghan government was more in line with the will of the Afghan people or the Taliban is more in line with the will of the people. But from what I'm seeing right now, I'm really inclined to believe it's the Taliban because they're the ones being demonized by the mainstream media. They're the ones who are being made to be the new boogeyman set up as the excuse to go back in or intervene with military aid or whatever it is. I don't think they're going to get away with it, though. What it looks like, and again, I, I... all my commentary I leave open to possibilities coming up that would uh, completely contradict what I'm about to say, but it looks like the Taliban has so much popular support and positive momentum that the international community is going to recognize the Taliban or their new name for the official country, government, whatever, as the legitimate government of the country of Afghanistan. More than likely. And they're looking at the Trump supporters in America and those who are at the Capitol going like, hey, you want an insurgency? This is how you do it. But you got to have, you got to, you know, it, 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 it only happens this way. Uh, and it's going to be really exciting to see the story written from different perspectives over the next few years. But that uh, the dramatic moment of an end of an era or an occupation is, is not going to apply the same way to the United States, but we have a lot of lessons to learn from this. All right, and we got a couple callers backstage. Looks like AJ was able to reconnect. Let's see if he's got a better signal. AJ, welcome back. Would you mind guys? giving us your uh, military resume, please? Uh, yeah, I was an 11 Bravo with the United States Army, uh, 10th Mountain Division. Uh, went to Afghanistan in 2013, 2014. Uh, was attached with third group special forces on my deployment, but we didn't really get to do anything that cool to say. Uh, we were just uplift. We got to drive and gun for him. That's really it. Wait, you mean the war didn't live up to your fantasy from Hollywood? No way. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. So what do you feel the need to vent about right now watching this past week's news? I'm confused uh, on how to really feel about it. Um, As a libertarian, you know, I'm glad that it's over. But as a veteran that was actually over there, you know, I feel like we didn't we didn't get the job done, even though our job over there was not for what we were sent there for. You know yeah, I mean? let me. Yeah, again, this is I, sorry to interrupt, but this is important to me. Let me suggest that framing of no, you got the job done, bro. You, you suffered and and rich men got richer and 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 that was the job you got it done you were a perfect victim that's that's what's to me that's that's the the crux of the mixed feelings that a lot of vets who haven't processed this yet as i have i think and a lot of libertarians have and we're ahead of the rest of the veteran population in america because we've gone through this and we've had we've by our political positions been forced to confront this and for in my case to admit yep i was a party to a war crime and i was a war criminal because i violated conventions about torture and it's it's admitting that that we were victims and and seeing the effort in afghanistan come to this end makes that kind of undeniable yeah. and a lot of guys are avoiding it i think and i think i think that i think mixed i think your mixed feelings if i may humbly suggest sir are are rooted in a kind of avoidance does that make sense no can you explain that the reality of i put my life on the line and i fell for the scam and i fell for the propaganda and i was a sucker it's hard to admit no, you're absolutely right. And and I think you're you even even for you as a libertarian who can accept that framing as a potential analysis. There's something in in our identities as veterans that we are all holding on to in some way that this is sort of forcing us to let go of. 
Yeah. That's tough. It's 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 like uh, a kind of a, a, a partial ego death by circumstance. Like whatever right. part of your ego was based on a mythology that is being shattered by the reality of the fucking headlines right now. Like th there was for a lot of veterans and, and, and myself included, I'm not perfect on having evolved past this and rid myself of all my militarist propaganda pollution in my head. But it, it, it's to me, this is just reaffirming the process I've gone through. But a part of that process was letting go of that identity that that I got that satisfaction, the sense of who I am as, as a veteran, as something that was righteous, as opposed to something that was now. Nah, yeah. You know, Adam, I think it's funny, too, because. Because of my experience, I have gotten uh, involved with uh, AA mm. because I ended up with a, you know, I became an alcoholic. Some of the shit that, you know, I was put through over there. And you said it yourself, the ego, you know, they mention it in AA all the time. You got to get rid of that ego. You got to swallow that pride. So you're right, Adam. I do need to swallow. I need to. I need to get rid of that ego. And you thought you were coming here to vent and I cut you off with that. Uh, oh man. No, that's beautiful. I'm glad you were so receptive to that because that's really powerful. And, and I, I, I think, you know, in, in that sense of letting go of the ego associated with military experience and combat vet status, I'm 95% of the way there. It sounds like you're 60, 70 percent of the way there, but there's, seeing this is like a big chunk that still hurts, right? Yeah, it still hurts. You're letting go of a chunk, and and I hope that vets like us who are ahead of the rest of the veterans community in that process, uh, you know, can take this as a as a powerful moment to reach them. Did you want me to read that? Was that was that comment? No, not not, not critical. Me. I'm not. I'm not backstage right now. Remember edits? Oh yeah. Oh, well, all right. Oh, there we go. Uh, Carrie Espinosa on YouTube comments, exactly shattered by reality out of indoctrination. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And and that indoctrination, the, the pain is that that most Americans today have their ego built around the identity that they formed through that indoctrination. They're a citizen. They're a patriot. They're a soldier, whatever it is that, that 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 gives them that sense of self. Matt Baxley, this guy needs to get involved in home front battle buddies. Absolutely, yeah. Well, you know, I, of course, uh, I, I I hope that's a big part of what we can do, and I would uh, hope that when we're putting out a call for uh, our first formal retreats, that you'll be paying attention. We should have an email list put together by then. But homefrontbattlebuddies.com, AJ. I hope you check it out. Absolutely. Um, what what else do you feel the need to vent about? Is there anything else you're processing or that this is bringing up for you? How do, how can I, I mean, and I heard Justin talk about, you know, the gold star families, because we had a KIA in our, in our company who mm -hmm. right at the end of our deployment, we went through our entire deployment with, I think only five, five purple hearts. It wasn't until mm. the last month of our deployment we had our first KIA, mm. and, or our only KIA in our company, and they're having a hard time. And I can't just go up to them and say, "Oh, sorry, your son was a victim." I, what What can I do? What can I say to that? You know, like what What can I, as a libertarian, as a veteran, how do I, with our mindset, Adam, like? We know what the real answer is to say. We know what to say to them. But how can I say that? What can I say to them to, to comfort them, I guess? You know, like, or is it even my problem? You know? I, I tried talking to my sponsor about it in AA. He's not a veteran. He doesn't know. He said, spoke to, speak to God about it. God hasn't told me anything. Not to get all spiritual on you, but... 
I don't know. Well, let me yeah, let me let me present what is, has been a helpful analysis in my activism to try to answer that question. First of all, I would reject any language or framing of it in terms of duty or responsibility or obligation or it's your problem. No, it's not your problem. It's your opportunity. And what you have as a veteran with that particular credibility. And, you know, I'm a fan of Ron Paul's quote. You don't have to go to Iraq to read the Constitution. Like, you don't have to be a veteran to know that war is a racket and that the, the invasions and occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan were war crimes top to bottom. But you have an opportunity as a veteran to reach people with compassion in a way that people who need that cannot get it from anyone else. And what you are doing, if you, if you speak to, say, the, the family of, of your unit's KIA, and, and they're watching this, and they're going, what the fuck? Did my son die for nothing? Biden screwed it up? Wait, did Trump screw it up? Did Bush, Obama, whatever? It doesn't matter. It was, it was a failure by the publicly stated goals. And holding on to that mythology is creating a toxic internal conflict for them that is going to be manifest in painful ways, maybe they'll be able to pass it on, right? If, that, if our generation stays in denial, there will be another fall of some other foreign capital at the end of an American military occupation. But if we learn the lessons, we can make sure it never happens again. And I think for the Gold Star family, is it essential that those particular individuals know the truth about what 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 happened no if they're if they're dealing with bigger problems if it's going to cripple them if it's going to destroy their if they can't psychologically handle facing up to that maybe the most compassionate thing to do is triage and and, and overlook some of those cases but for those who are ready for it what you are doing is providing them an incredible service of relief of a burden of a lie of an internal contradiction and sharing with them the opportunity to join us in the anti-war, anti-militarism, pro-freedom cause to keep moving humanity past the status paradigm that allows war crimes like this to happen in the first place. I hope that was not too complex or verbose. I hope you get the simple point there. Well, Adam, I got to just let you know, man, I got to get going. I'm on the clock. Uh, but I do just want to say... Hey, thank you, man. You're the fucking shit. I love you. And I did vote for you. And I'm voting for you till the day I die. Keep running. For All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, brother. I appreciate you listening at work and calling in at work. And it's awesome to have you engaged in this thoughtful conversation as a veteran, uh, especially this particular moment in time when I think this could be the catalyst, really, for a revival of a veteran's anti-militarism movement. I don't know. That's a clumsy way of saying it. But for veterans, I, this this should be a call as a moment in American history for American veterans to step up and have a, a, a voice in the conversation. So with that, we have uh, Mayor Mir, one more caller before we get to our guest, at least. And then uh, we, we'll, hit a, we'll, we'll hit our couple of uh, COVID headlines. So let's go ahead and get Mayor Mir on screen here. Good morning, sir. Hello, hello, hello. Shit. Ma'am, excuse me. Shit. You sound Can fine, you dear. Yes, loud and clear. I can't hear. Oh, I'm um, sorry. I can't hear myself on here. So I'm just looking at you. <laughs> I've never done this before. So first time no caller worries. in on this Streamlabs. <clears throat> um, StreamYard, but yes, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a fun platform. I appreciate you taking a shot with it. Yeah, I've never, never seen it before. So, you know, I've got to jump in there best I can, but, you know, don't want to put my face out there. Just have to say that. Um, no problem. So I just came up. Um, I've, I've heard about you a while ago, but then kind of didn't hear about you and then found you through Slow News Day kind of deal. Um, and, uh, yeah. That's yeah. Andrew Papoinen, um, right? 
or Stephen Pekoinen, excuse me. That's Steve Poikinen. Yeah. yeah. Steve Poikinen. Um, yeah. I, I said uh, his name him wrong five free- different ways. It's spelled really oh, funny, too. Oh, it's horrible. Too. It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, great guy. I met him through his work with uh, fighting for, for the, yeah, for Assange. Absolutely. He does, he does great work there. Yeah. So thank you for making yeah, the connection been, there. Yeah. Yeah, he's been doing it. I fought him since like 18. So, mm. um, but yeah, I'm a four time war vet, and that's uh, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Yep, yeah, 86 to 91. Mm. And then did Afghanistan from 11 to 13. So, went oh twice. my God, you're twice. one of those. Well, wow. I was no, in the we first had, time. I remember when right? I was. Yeah, well, no, when I was in Fallujah, it was like we had one or two Marines in the unit who were really old gunnies and first sergeants going, well, you know, when we were here last time, and I was like, oh, oh, geez. But yeah, inter- that that is a very, well, very cool uh, sort of unique experience in terms of the insight. So please, w- what do you think of what's happening right now? Um, I got tears in my eyes right now. Because it's um, it's all bullshit, <laughs> and um, for someone that has uh, been very outspoken about, um, excuse me, fraud, waste, and abuse, and you know, had a, had a sister in the military, and then went to the VA, and she was doing contracting, and you know, I just saw just how much money was wasted by our federal government. And I look at this, you know, I'm 53, so I'm not that damn old, <laughs> but you know, you to go in you as a young, in, um, I was an E4. I was the last when, of the buck sergeants. It you doesn't were an even E4 exist when you got out there. after that much time in? No, no, no. I now see this is the deal. I was in the air force. From 86 to 91, oh. got out, got married, yeah. right? My ex retired, wow. let him do it okay. because get, you know, joint assignments. And, you know, that's a sacrifice that a woman will make. Um, but uh, got divorced, uh, got back into uh, contracting. I worked, I don't know if you know where the Marshall Islands are. Mm-hmm. Um, halfway between Hawaii and Australia, I was. I did a. a, a I mean, a lot of people in here don't I mean, like I'm Elon like Musk. I'm like a good American. I couldn't actually find them on a map, but I can pretend like I know where they are. Right. It's a pretty sad situation, too. I mean, it's, it seems like my whole career. You know, I. I tried to be a good person anywhere I've ever gone. I'm not religious. Grew up in North Carolina. You know, I saw the hypocrisy of what it does and I've traveled and seen it, you know, I've everywhere I've gone, I've just tried to be a good person and, and absorb their cultures. And I got much more from it, from doing that. And to learn to, to like differences and to respect them, you know, I don't care. I guess I've never been a voter. I've never voted, but I've served under four private, you know, it's just a bizarre thing in this day and age. You said something yesterday that hit me that said, hopefully we're growing into a more peaceful human. And, I, and I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, because um, in Afghanistan, we got to, you know, the Corps of Engineers is who I initially went to Afghanistan with. Okay. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So if they say, Say Biden saying that we didn't go there to rebuild. What the fuck was the core doing there? All right. Well, I, 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 I want to try to yeah. zero in on something here that uh, to, to tap your perspective uh, and, and connect to to your emotional response to this situation. When you say you know you always thought you were a good person, I mean it's in that sense, defined by intent. If you are, uh, you're, you're still a good person. If you get suckered into doing something bad, if your intent was good, right. I mean, you could say that you're not, 
You know, we have to admit our weaknesses as veterans in the sense that we fell for it. We fell for a lot of propaganda. But it sounds to me, and I, I'd like your thoughts on this, if this, if this, you know, try this idea on, if this fits for you, that part of the emotional conflict is uh, accepting that your good nature was taken advantage of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do feel that. Um, but here again, you know, I'm, I'm looking at a watercolor that I bought in Kabul. And I never carried a weapon in Afghanistan. I never carried one. I was always inside the wire. I got out once. I, we snuck out in Maja Sharif. So went and got some alcohol. <laughs> I mean, there was ways around it. Um, but, you know, it does scare me in a sense that, you know, the Afghan women that I did meet, huh, you know, they do want better. But, you know, as a woman, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I don't have my face on this camera is that it's, it's scary for women in the world and it's, we're not as safe. And if you're in the minority, you don't have a voice. So hope, I mean, they're saying like, this is going back to, you know, I sent you a link that said to watch, I don't believe in the base, you know, he's returned, you know, these, what do they call them? These um, born again Christians right now, they scare the shit out of me. That's um, this guy that's doing this shadow gate. I asked you if you'd seen that video. Did you happen mm. to watch that? I have the link pulled up on my Chrome browser on my phone. I haven't watched it yet. Right. So I, I came, you know, have just come across this within the past six year, maybe. And I look back. I mean, it just makes you look at things like, holy crap. You know, hearts and minds. Did you ever get hear that terminology? We're there to oh, win yeah. the hearts I, and minds. I was civil affairs. That's front and center for us. Yeah. Right. So he didn't, there was, I never mentioned that, you know. You know, I gave briefings to newcomers that <laughs> totally explained that whole thing. You know, a newcomer's briefing every two weeks. We got new in, you know, I mean, I was there. I was in the Taliban's last stand with a contractor, 250,000 troops. I put in and out of there. Um, so to see that, you know, just these recent re reportings this morning about the Taliban is not being, they're not challenging. They're, they're going to offer asylum for government workers. They want better. It just it just clicks in my head that this is part of the Great Reset, right? China has been there. I stood in DFAC lines and the Chow Hall lines with Chinese soldiers. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was completely full of nations that uh, people would never even heard of. The coalition so, of the I willing. Mean, was, yeah, I crossed paths with some Korean troops in weird uniforms. Sure, they were there too. Everybody was there. And, you know, it's just a matter of, I hope that we as veterans can look at this situation and see, yep, we were lied to. Yep, this was for a different purpose. Nope, oh my gosh, Russia, China, Iran, they're all working together. Israel, they're all working together with us for this, it seems like we couldn't get people to do what you're doing, you know, to, to be, don't consume, you know, it, our whole economy in this world has got to change for uh, people don't want to believe in climate change. I've been in one place the longest for the longest time and I've seen the climate get hotter. I've seen more, you know, I feel like it is happening. And we can't get people to stop, stop consuming, stop doing this, stop. So it's like, okay, well, here we go. Pandemic, here we go. So we need to reroute all this control to control the masses. But yet, as Americans, I mean, the history that we've been given is so just 
propaganda. I mean, it just it's just disgusting, and I don't. Yeah. Yes, 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 and I don't know. You seem crazy enough to be able to do something like this. That I'm willing to. You know, we do need some leaders because people won't take the initiative on themselves. They're too comfortable. You know, I feel like most of these people will be cover for me. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? At this point, I don't want to save them if it comes down to it because you can't reach them for some reason. It's like this big, I'm not, I don't want to say where I am, but it's in the South and fuck Trump. He's just as bad as all of them. You know what I'm saying? It's it's just this game that we pour all this money into that we don't get anything for except trouble. Well, Ms. Muir, I, I if I may, I would I would call on you. You know, the theme of yesterday's show was strategically choosing harmony over conflict whenever possible. And it sounds like you're falling into a conflict mentality here with those people. And I would just remind you of why we joined the military in the first place. We wanted to serve. We wanted to be the shield that guards the realms of men. It's the, oh wait, no, that was Game of Thrones. Uh, but we wanted to have our lives on the line to protect <laughs> America, to protect our fellow countrymen. Uh, I want to, before you go, uh, I want to read this, this this comment with you on on the line here from Benjamin Brixey on Facebook. Thank you for sharing your stories. We need to hear these stories to do better. I'm sorry for your pain, and we will do better. So I, I would think that, uh, or I, I would hope that that we would take this as the opportunity to get in touch with why we enlisted in the first place and what it really means to be a warrior or a public servant or whatever it was that, that, that caused you to join the military in the first place. Because as, as much as it's an act of you know ignorance and cowardice and greed in a lot of ways, for those of us who joined for righteous reasons, it was at its core uh, a selfless act in the warrior spirit, uh, very much perverted uh, and abused, as your good intentions were by the institutions that we gave authority over us. But uh, thank you for the call. I really appreciate you sharing your story, dear. Sure. All right. Uh, we're a little late for our guest here, I believe. Uh, we have, he's been backstage this whole time. So we will come back and we'll get into our little, I mean, our, should we just do the COVID block really quick? It's really dumb. It's a dumb it's really COVID dumb. block. We do COVID blocks every day. Right. All right. Well, I mean, good wait. It's, Alex is more important. Alex is more important. Uh, and I'm callers and vets cool callers. Talk about. So we had, we have, we have a bunch of fun blocks. We might get to after Alex, if we don't have any callers, uh, but we're going to talk to Alex for about 30 minutes here and catch up on First Nations Caucus and what he's doing with the LP in Arizona. Uh, but afterwards, we want to go back uh, if, if to uh, to hearing from vets, particularly uh, Afghanistan veterans, uh, but really anybody or, or families of uh, the veterans or people who are deployed right now, perhaps. But anybody who has a personal connection, especially, excuse me, to the uh, the end of the. Should I just fucking call it a war? Because it's shorter than occupation, four syllables versus one. The Afghanistan war is is, is over. I just should I give in to the semantics of that? The war's over. You just the said war's the over. semantics. Does it matter? It does in this case because it's important to distinguish for me that it, it, to me it's a part of the humility of my experience as a veteran, but also the reality that I did not fight in a war. I fought an occupation. I was part of a an imperial military occupation of a foreign country that was a war crime top to bottom and and to me that distinction is very important so it's not fair to call it a war no that's, and same that's, is true in, in, in that sense uh afghanistan is just like Iraq, right all right ladies and gentlemen our guest today is alex flores arizona native proprietor of the mobile auto repair business greasy porcupines love the name is the recently elected lnc region one alternate which is like way cooler than it sounds it means <laughs> Of, of the uh, faceless decision-making authority that is the board, the Libertarian National Committee, uh, he, he, he has one of, I don't know, what is it, a couple dozen votes altogether? It fluctuates. I don't care to keep up with those particulars. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a thankless job because I don't know if Alex is a CIA planner, an FBI agent, but half the people on the LNC probably are. 
in addition to his role with the LNC, he is also secretary of the Arizona LP, chair of the Navajo County LP, and founder of the Libertarian Party First Nations Caucus. Now, Alex, I understand uh, you want to focus on that today. Uh, for an activist like yourself, my platform is at your service. Uh, so, good morning. Welcome to the show. <clears throat> good morning, Adam. Thanks for having me on. Are you calling from a cave, or is that just like special, eerie, cool lighting you're trying to pull off there? No, this is actually, it's just a better, it's just, there's a, a light up here to kind of, for Zoom lean and in. stuff like that. Lean, lean in, lean into the light. Yes, this is your face. <laughs> All right. So, um, how you doing? I mean, I, we haven't caught up in person for a while, considering you, you know you, you live within a couple hours of Gardenia. Um, I've been I've been a little disconnected from LP Arizona and Arizona politics. I mean, we cover the national stuff and the recount, and oh my, it's Arizona politics is pretty embarrassing, isn't it? It's it's been very interesting. Um, I've you know I've been involved with the AZLP in particular, uh, pretty heavily for the last four years now. And, uh, it, it's, it's pretty grimy here, uh, especially with the duopoly and what they do to us, but, um, we're still fighting a good fight. Yeah. The suppression of third parties, which means the libertarian party in Arizona is, 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 a, is a pretty unique phenomenon. I mean, we're not like worst in the country, but, Top ten for institutionalized duopoly oppression of the LP. So it's it's definitely an, an, an interesting role that you've carved out for yourself and four years now secretary of the state party. Uh, is there anything else you want to talk about with with your activism in general or or what's going on in Arizona? Uh, so I took on county development in Arizona uh, in about 2019. Um, and basically, my goal is to get the county parties in Arizona chartered and affiliated. Um, at the time, we only had six county parties in Arizona, and only I think at that point we only I think Maricopa County is the only one that has ballot access left. Uh, I think Pima County may be another one, um, but I'm not exact. I'm not certain on their ballot access status right now. Um, <clears throat> but we had you know only six parties that were chartered. Uh, within the state here. Um, and so I made it my goal, uh, especially when I was elected secretary in, in uh, January, um, I made it my goal to get the county parties affiliated and so that we could have a county affiliate in every county in Arizona. And so far we've gotten four up and going uh, since January. And uh, we're looking to get the rest of them by the end of the year. Um, we may, I, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to make that goal uh, by the end of this year. Um, I think we'll be able to at least get the pop, the most populous counties of Arizona. Um, but there's just a, there are a couple of rural counties that are just, their voter registration numbers just aren't there as far as uh, mm -hmm. what, what we need for continued representation. Um, but we're, we're pretty close. So. Well, Alex, I got to ask you to step back for a minute for the, not inside baseball political nerds of the Libertarian Party who might have accidentally wandered into our audience today. Uh, <laughs> what is the significance of county affiliates in the Libertarian Party organizational structure and why are they important? Um, I, I mean, so every, you know, all, all the, the you know, major parties have, you know, affiliates that are broken down all the way down to the precinct level. Um, and for the Libertarian Party, for us to be able to... Uh, We're not trying to be that organized. Just <laughs> counting, not precinct. Right. So, uh, well, well, there are states that do legislative district, but uh, here in Arizona, we're just trying to get the counties on board. And uh, what that will do is, you know, it'll put people that are um, able to uh, support candidates all over the state. So... Hold on, Alex. I'm sorry to interrupt again. But I want to explain, I, I think the terminology you just used there might be a little misleading. She said, get the counties on board. What that means materially, this is what I want people to understand, is it just means getting like three officers to fill out the paperwork and register with the state party and try to host regular monthly meetings. Because that, and this is to me, again, this is what I want people to understand. You know, we have a national organization that you're a part of with the LNC. You're you're a multi-level libertarian. Um, but you got you, you know, you're involved at the national level, at the state level, and the county level. 
And the, the national organization has a staff and it has the Libertarian National Committee and and they meet at, sporadically. It's not like it's a full time job being on the LNC. You have an email list, monthly calls, emergency calls, bullshit drama calls, things like that. But then you the, the states kind of meet even less. Right. State parties, you know, they have an email list. They meet virtually. Um, well, it depends on the state. I don't know. Arizona is probably a pretty, pretty well organized, vigorous state party organization. But the most regular meetings and the sort of heart and soul or the backbone. I don't know. I didn't pass anatomy in college, uh, but whatever it is, you metaphor you want to use it, where the rubber meets the road of regular libertarian engagement is county village having monthly meetings. Right. That's what I was getting at. Yeah, it's it's it, it's, it's there's like, no county affiliate. You don't you we can't tell you to show up to one of our meetings. Right. It's like the entry level. And uh, even here in Arizona, it's all codified in the law. So uh, all the way down to what was what's called a precinct committeeman, which is like one step above being a registered member of a party. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's basically just, uh, you know, these different levels of boots on the ground. And the, the very base level of it is, you know, the county affiliates and what they're doing locally. All right. First Nations Caucus, I know uh, with our state chair, Emily, this has been uh, an issue that she's been passionate about. Uh, something for me in the back of my mind, um, having attended the Native American prep school as the one white kid. And uh, by the way, I'm the only white kid who will have ever graduated from the Native American prep school because it shut down a year after I, I did. Um, but I, I think it's especially important for us as libertarians to remember that love and compassion and ethics are really the drivers of our message and why we do what we do and to empathize and with the victims of the state is essential to actually addressing the injustices of the state. And I would say making that connection with the libertarian party and the native American community in this country is one that's long overdue. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I mean, it's. I feel like it's something that uh, we were pretty strong about in the '80s. You know, Russell Means was our our presidential one yeah. of our presidential uh, nominees, or you know, was yes. was running for the exactly. nomination yes. against Ron, Ron Paul. And uh, yes. I feel like at that point, it was kind of like two different you know directions for the party, and uh, that you know um, the party went with Ron Paul, but the the Native American issue was still there, and uh, you know. Um, you know, the tyranny that happens in Native America is, is very real. And um, it's it's something that uh, I feel like the Libertarian Party with its platform is in a unique position to actually give some solutions to. Um, whereas the federal government um, has a long history of not, you know, of terrible solutions and also, um, you know, tokenism, you know, basically giving lip service to an issue and not really doing anything about it. Say, say, Alex, you are, I hate it when libertarians make such ridiculous concessions to the state. You're saying that the American government had so, had bad solutions for the Native American. No, 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 no. They are a victim class in terms of the federal government's history in the United States. Is that the federal government has bad solutions? I mean, maybe you want to look at it that way, being still being ridiculously generous to the current bureaucrats who run the BIA and the Department of the Interior and set so many other bullshit policies where Native Americans in this country either live in casino-funded luxury spots or ghettos. Yeah, and I mean, even for some parts of the, the it's like, you know, they're still in the 14th century in certain reservations. Like, uh, you know, a third of the, almost a third of the Navajo reservation doesn't have running water or electricity in their homes. So mm. we're still... We still got a long ways to go in a lot of areas. Well, so tell us about the vision for the Libertarian Party First Nations Caucus. Um, so the caucus is basically uh, what we want to do, um, you know, is we're, we're trying to be the change that we want to see in the world, uh, have representation for tribal communities in the LP and on the LNC that's not reflected in Congress or government at this time. Mm. Um the we want to reaffirm the commitment to uh, setting the sovereign nations free that Russell Means made in his candidacy. Um, you know, educate 
the libertarians who haven't had personal experience in native lands um, as to why, you know, Ayn Rand was wrong and why seeking, mm -hmm. you know, justice and self-rule for First Nations is not, you know, identity politics, it's truth telling about government lies, government oppression, government treaty breaking yeah. you know, and genocide. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I know the, the history of broken treaties, I mean, that you bring that up, is there, uh, so yeah, I, I mean, obviously I have a, a personal interest in this based on my proposal of how to solve this whole mess. Uh, with decentralization, localization, my presidential platform that had the opportunity for every uh, recognized, at least every currently recognized Native nation to claim complete sovereignty. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, a lot of people who would say that that's too much too soon. But considering how little trust their properly is between the Native American community and the federal government, uh, peaceful secession and a chance to get some of your shit back that's been stolen seems like it might be a pretty good option, no? Definitely. Yeah, um, I would like to see uh, these, uh, you know, there are, you know, 574 nations within the the United States boundaries. There are 574 recognized tribes, and I would love Sick. to see... Hold on. I've been getting that wrong in my talking point this whole time. I was saying 562. Has that been updated? Were there, were there splits in the last year and a half or something? Oh, my God. Is that the updated count? What's the number? It's 574 uh, now. The number that I had was 574, but... Um, yeah, um, I, I would like to see those tribes at, at the very minimum have representation uh, on their yes. own that they haven't had before. You know, there are currently uh, six Native Americans in Congress, and um, I would like to to see at the very least to have them represented by their own uh, people. And um, once decentralization, yeah, would be ideal to see these nations take back their sovereign power. Um, right now they kind of function like, I think they, they label them something like federally dependent nations now, uh, mm. as opposed to being a sovereign nation. So it's this weird classification that they've now had for, yeah. uh, reservations. And I, I, um, I definitely would like to see it, the sovereignty restored. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a polite way of avoiding calling, calling them second class citizens in a lot of cases. Right. So right. I, I see there's sort of two, it's a good segue. I, I, I want to ask you. Uh, sort of a two-part question, and and maybe answer uh, first with the part. Uh, oh, I see that you have sort of two categories of, of goals possibly for the Libertarian Party First Nations Caucus, and one would be in practical policy, and the other would be in political development, organization, and alliance building. So first, in terms of act, like the reason I was pointing out my my ultimate solution for this. And, and by the way, Liberty on YouTube, I see your comment. We'll come back to Greasy Porcupines at the end and give Alex a chance to plug everything he wants. But um, the uh, practice, the, the immediate, what, what is the immediate practical policy that you would want to see prioritized to uh, alleviate the suffering under statism of uh, Native Americans? Well, policy wise, um, they're. Uh, the focus that I've had lately has has had a lot to do with water rights issues. Um, the, the Colorado River Compact just entered a uh, what they what they call a, a stage one shortage, meaning that yeah. like, um, which will affect Arizona the worst, even though we're the ones that probably need that water the most. Um, yeah, a lot of that water in the Colorado River gets diverted to California and other places, and um, there are you know the for places like the Navajo Nation, um, things like running water, uh, things like uh, clean drinking water and uh, access to it are, are something that's not really readily available. And uh, so, um, I would I would say that the first thing that we could do um, would be to um, I, to re renegotiate the, the the Colorado River Compact. I think that there's a lot of uh, you know, we've had made a lot of advancements in technology, and I think that if we were to invest in that technology um, to 
take some of that dependence off of that river water from other areas uh, that mm -hmm. the tribes that, you know, the river actually runs through could actually use those resources um, as it is right now. Like that uh, short while ago, the Navajo nation was even experiencing, um, they were rationing water, uh, something like 500 gallons a week for a family of four. Um, and so uh, policy, what I would like, to, you know, something that I'd like to see first off with the policy would be something with a renegotiation of the Colorado River Compact. Um, and that's, that's outward mm. policy. Uh, with internal policy, what I would like to see is, what, what our goal is, is to set up um, LP affiliates uh, within tribal, within uh, tribal nations. So um, the first one that we're looking at uh, setting up a, uh, an LP affiliate with is the Navajo Nation. Um, they're, you know, simply because they're the biggest and uh, they, their, their geographic uh, location and, and the span of being span of, of four states is kind of unique for them. And so, mm -hmm. um, them being able to to have their own representation uh, as a nation as opposed to being split up between whatever state they happen to reside in uh, yeah i think will be a huge difference so it's kind of like the libertarian party can set the example in a way for what we'd like to see in terms of recognition politically that in a sense we i, I don't want to say we have failed but uh what you're what you're creating with this is a new mechanism for us to succeed in being the example of our values within our own organization by having a, a, a First Nations caucus and, and having it serve as a mechanism to support uh, affiliates within actual tribal political areas, uh, however those might be broken down. Um, it, but it, it seems like that also very directly connects to what you mentioned as the prior priority issues at Colorado River. It sounds like, though, you would include in that category other issues with land use and mineral rights and uh, of course waterway access as we saw a lot of those issues raised with the dakota access pipeline uh do you have any comments on that or, or thoughts of how that might be relevant yeah i mean we've seen it a, 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 a bad you know a terrible history of you know so supposedly sovereign nations uh not having the sovereignty to do uh what they need to do uh with their resources and um you know taking for example here in the 90s we had the uh the, Ho the navajo hopi land dispute where overnight fifteen thousand navajo you know navajo nation residents found themselves on the wrong side of the fence because the mm -hmm. the they had discovered uranium <laughs> In a, yeah, and they had discovered uh, uranium in a in a mesa that was at that time located on the Navajo reservation, um, and they they wanted they they tried to negotiate with the Navajo Nation to purchase the land. The Navajos didn't want to give it up because they considered it sacred land. Well, then the federal government stepped in, gave the land to the Hopi tribe because the Hopis didn't consider it sacred, and. Mm. The Hopi tribe sold the land, and now there's a uranium mine in Arizona. So, um, there we've seen a long we've seen a long history of this, and and um, you know there there the Democrats pay lip service to a lot of the issues, but they don't really do things. Um, there's a lot of collusion that happens with Democrats and some of the upper leadership of some of these nations uh, to where. Um, a lot of the the resources and help that's sent by the federal government doesn't even make it to the, the level of the yeah, average citizen. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, uh, resource allocation is a huge deal and like being able to do what they want with their own land. Um, yeah. Something that like, seems like it should just be a given, like living in the, you know, within the United States that, you know, if we, if we purchase a piece of land, we can do almost whatever. I mean, you know, there's, there's yeah, zoning, yeah, yeah, zoning yeah, yeah. and all that crap. But, like, <laughs> Oh yeah, we know. <laughs> yeah, well, I, sure. I, I want to see, uh, before we give you a chance to, to promote greasy porcupines and anything else you want to plug, uh, I want to see if maybe I can cut as deep as we possibly can on the issue of Native American politics in America right now. And by that, I want, I, I mean that I, what, what I want to point out in, in all these issues that you have raised there seems to be a dehumanization. You, you, your children 
It, it, it seems like you know this is what the government is telling the Native American communities in this country. You're children. You're not really, or, or you're subhuman. You know, you, you don't really get the full rights of a human being. You don't really own that land. I mean, we could take it at any time. We'll pretend to let you have it. But if we feel like violating a treaty, we'll shit. Our services are for sale to the highest bidder who wants to put in a uranium mine. And when I look at even the textbook history of Native American experience since, you know, European expansion, uh, you know, I, I very tragically relate as a veteran to the soldiers who were responsible for a lot of the violence of that oppression and conquest and, and mur mass murder. And I think about what made it possible for me to commit torture in Iraq was a certain conditioning of dehumanization of the enemy. And whether we admit it or not, we act policy-wise as a country like Native Americans are still less than human. And it's really fucked up when you, when you really cut to the heart of it that way. Uh, is that relevant to this? Do you think you're, is that, that present to your work? And then is, is there some call to fight a cultural assertion of like, no, you, we got to humanize Native Americans as, as normal fucking human beings who are entitled to basic rights and are capable of managing their own natural resources. Yeah, I mean, with a lot of the work I, I, I'm in, as I, I, I tend to focus more on sovereignty because I don't feel like the relationship that we... I, I don't feel like there's any relationship that tribes can have with the federal government that's going to be beneficial to them overall. Um, we have a, a history... Since the, since the you know since the Declaration of Independence you know in the Declaration of Independence they called Native Americans savages so mm -hmm. I mean since since that point in time we've had this substandard you know class of citizens is what Native Americans are considered and uh, you know we've had a history since then of over 400 broken treaties that now comprise what's called Title 25 uh, which is Indians you know the the Code of Federal Regulations literally is titled you know, for title 25 is literally called Indians. Um, and so, um, and, and that's basically what's written out in there is everything that, you know, it has comprised what's left over of those treaties of, um, what's yeah. been broke. So and, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's not so much a, a call to humanize native Americans, but to go, Hey, we've recognized that they're humans for a long time. Let's start acting like it policy wise and live up to what we really believe in as, as a country in terms of a righteous caring paradigm. I uh, got to go for the super chat from Justin O'Donnell on YouTube, O'Donnell for Liberty Wayne and for $5. Alex, do you think the Canadian government has any obligation for reparations regarding the tragedy in Kamloops, Kamloops? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Reparations is a difficult subject um, because I, 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 while I do feel that like some rights need to be wronged or some wrongs need to be corrected, you know, right. uh, from, <laughs> from, from our past that uh, also at the same time, it's, it's, we like, I, you know, um, nobody alive today has oppressed me or, you know, was, uh, were the people that were oppressing my ancestors, but um how they i think how they do um reparations matters uh whether it's you know giving land back or um you know i've you know i i don't really uh like the idea of financial cash payouts as reparations um you know it's basically we're taking extorted money and giving it to people who um it creates a dependency. Um, yeah. I feel like more than it actually um, enables people to get out of these. Yes. Giving someone an allowance is never making a victim whole. Right. Uh, that's, that's, that's your, I think what you're kind of dancing around a little bit is the eternal libertarian conflict on reparations where we want justice. We want victims compensated as long as you don't create new victims out of taxpayers or society as a whole in doing so. And so when you can identify righteous reparations that don't do that, we're all for it. But if you're just going to steal from people, if, if government, I mean, it's like if I, if I punched you in the face and then you said, Hey man, you fucking owe me for that. And then I stole money from someone else to pay you off. It's like, well, <laughs> that's not reparations. That's just a new right. victim class. Yeah, obviously. Anyway, enough libertarian ranting, Alex, 
uh, it's it's been a lot of fun getting into the subject with you, and I'm I'm grateful for your work. Uh, we had a request earlier for you to plug Greasy Porcupines. Yeah, so um, yeah, I've been doing mobile auto repair service for a while, and uh, last year during the pandemic, I was you know during the well, I don't like to call it the pandemic. I like to call it the government shutdowns because that's what it was. Um, mm -hmm. But I I like to uh, you know I was running into a lot of customers that were foregoing basic automotive needs because they just couldn't afford it. Um, you know, mm. they had been out of work for weeks or months yeah. and, uh, you know, their, their job had been shut down or something and, uh, they just weren't, they just didn't have the income and the stimuluses weren't cutting it. And, uh, so, um, I, I started greasy porcupines as a way to help people that, um, aren't able to afford all of those services. And it's, a, it's basically a pay what you can service. Um, so, mm. we, so, uh, as, a people can't afford things. Um, you know, if they can afford the parts, then I can usually work with them on the labor and, uh, you know, we can even do some type of bartering or, you know, yeah. um, mutual aid. Um, yeah. I'm all about that as well. You know, I, I've worked with a couple of, uh, you know, businesses in Phoenix that, you know, trade me, um, their services in exchange for mine. So, um, the, the, the idea is basically to just help people get back on the road and to help, um, get people be able to, make their livelihoods again. Um, yeah. you know, uh, no, you found a very cool niche there. Is, is there a chance you could like franchise this with an app maybe? Yeah, no, that's the eventual plan is to, to, um, to Uber everything as Gary Johnson would say, yes. Uber, make it Uber for, for small time barter based vehicle repairs that involve community engagement and agorism. I love it. Right. That, yeah. yeah. And eventually would like Great. to also expand it. To expand to other services too like i've talked to some body shops that want to partner up and uh there have also been uh, some other mechanics nationwide um but also like plumbing services and things like that we'd eventually like to build it into an app-based service where people can look online and see if somebody in their area can help them out um and you know work out whatever you want to work out with them um and leave the government out of it all right. And the other website. So, well, first you've got greasyporcupines.org, facebook.com slash greasyporcupines. And for Libertarian Party First Nations Caucus, facebook.com slash LPFNC, Twitter, First Nations LP. And the website there is firstnationslibertarians.org. Uh, what can people do to help? Uh, yep. Yeah, you can, any of those websites have ways to sign up and subscribe, uh, send us your information on greasy porcupines. Uh, there is also a donate button. Um, if you would like to donate to help other people afford car parts, um, that's what that fund is for. Um, so yeah, uh, just go ahead and check out the links and there's ways to sign up there or you can get a hold of me personally if you know me. So awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. Appreciate it. And all your good work. Always good talking to you, Adam. All right. Let's get Ed back up here. If anybody wants to call in, this is your chance, especially uh, people who have a direct connection to the war in Afghanistan as uh, veterans or military families, especially. Uh, of course, we'd be happy to hear from contractors, anybody else directly affected by this, who is maybe processing some mixed feelings around the fall of Kabul and the unavoidable truths that we are being confronted with as a nation right now. Ed? You know, Adam, I'm personally, it just blazes right over me, doesn't even, doesn't touch me, doesn't stick, no nothing, I don't see it. I'm in motion doing my life, my things, you know, home front battle buddies, all these things that I'm involved in I have been trying to eliminate government by obsolescence, trying to make them obsolete. And yes. don't use them. Don't think about them. Don't let them involve your life. Don't let them touch your life. Sure. Try and, you know, gear your life around not them not even being there. And the less we together need them and don't even know about them, they'll wither away and die. They'll, they'll lose all relevance. And, you know, they got to make up something to come and get in our face and say, hey, you know, you got to do this because we're all in danger. It's like, I don't want to hear it from them. I don't want to hear any of the crap from them. I don't want to hear television and, and advertising and 
I don't want any of that. I'm 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 so involved right now with with real life issues that I Afghanistan doesn't doesn't really matter to me. Well, you know, Ed, I believe I'm with you on all of the premises of what you just said, but it sounds like you might be not giving due weight to the fact that so many people around us are going through a significant emotional experience with this. And even if we are like, like uh, w with our caller, AJ, you know, he says he's having mixed feelings. And I mean, I just threw out the numbers. It seems like he's 60, 70 percent of the way there of letting go of the military ego bullshit. Uh, whereas I'm like, I'm like 95 plus percent of the way there. So like, I'm not going to be affected by it. And so maybe I can't be an example for someone who's only, you know, zero percent of the way there. But maybe someone like AJ can connect with or express his mixed feelings in a way that gets that person from zero percent to 60 percent. And then doing the kind of slow personal work and introspection that I've done since getting with the Rock Veterans Against the War, at least, you know, I can get up to that point where I can say I'm like 95 plus percent settled on the you know militarist ego bullshit um you see my, an opportunity here my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge they are it, it, it's just they they've become too dependent and they're used by misinformation and bullshit and they can't see it they just can't see it they really can't I dealt with an individual this weekend that I gave him easy solutions, but he couldn't see it. He couldn't hear it. It didn't didn't touch him, and now he's in full of anguish for made up reasons. I mean, people are are making up reasons to to torture themselves out there, and it hurts me personally. It really does. Well, in that sense, I think the more I love my a, animals. <laughs> this this framing of the war was a success, not a failure, and we were victims, not participants, in terms of the the war crime design. Uh, I think sharing that understanding is so powerful and important right now, because of that denial that a lot of people are in. And we are in a unique position to educate by presenting a different analysis, a different story, a different understanding that explains the facts of history a fuck ton better than any whitewashed government textbook. That's a, that's a false hope, Adam. I'm sorry to tell you. I'm sorry to bust your fucking bubble, but it's a false hope. What, the, we can't educate people who aren't listening? No, the people don't have the understanding to hear your message. You have a very clear, easy message, but they don't have the understanding ability. They're fucking jumbled up. They can't process it. They can't. It's, it, it's just an impossibility. You know, I keep telling you, the only way you can change the future is to affect the children. All these people are already fucked up, and you're going to waste your time and your effort trying to fix them when they aren't really fixable. I mean, some of them are reachable, but only a small percentage of those you touch are really going to fucking get it and really going to sure. matter to do something. I'm telling you, the, the, let's find a way to tell the truth to the children and point out what's going around on around them if you want to explain stuff to somebody explain to children what's going on around them and how they're being set up to be used in the future okay and, you know, i i think i really passionately disagree with your negative assessment of human nature here though we are not uniquely uh, libertarians are special in a lot of ways but in terms of being able to have figured out what we have figured out, we're not. Yes, we tend to be smarter because most people who care and figure shit out and are engaged with the political conversation tend to be smarter. That's not like because it's not what makes us special, though. And and the calling now is to not throw up our hands and say, ah, fuck the adults and the boomers and, you know, old people are just going to have to wait for them to die. But to be more effective to be more patient to be more compassionate to be more to make it easy for them 
I mean, this idea that I broke down that you just said that the average American couldn't get, that the war was designed to make rich people rich at the expense of of everybody else. Like, I don't think like Dick Cheney and KBR and Halliburton are baked into the stories of, of Iraq and Afghanistan indelibly in such a way that I don't think it's hard to present this alternative narrative that libertarians have as an understanding of how wars happen in the military industrial complex to the average American. I have more confidence that the that we can break that down in a way that the average American can understand and might just be motivated to in light of current events. And you've been doing this how long? Half as long as you, 14 years. Yeah, and it's still going on and even worse, and we're not making a dent. I mean, we're trying, and I... I, 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 I see. Okay, so, Ed... Applaud the effort. Yeah, I, it's, now, it's, Ed, I... It's a good thing. This is really in line. To assuage our own consciousness, so at least we can say, well, we tried. We did something. You know? right, so, Ed, this is no bullshit. See, I have, I think that's a, that's a, that's a poisonous resignation in libertarian activism when we should be seen. And, and I, I want to do a better job of this with Adam versus the man editorially, besides just our Friday shows, but pointing out the positive dynamics in all of these things. For example, Iraq and Afghanistan, a shadow of the brutality of Vietnam. You remember? your era, the army, the, the brutality of the war, the violence of it with the average soldier in Vietnam experience was far more traumatizing than what the average soldier in Iraq and Afghanistan has experienced in, in the global war on terror. The fact that Joe Biden has to end the war this way and can't just keep it going. And not only that, but the idea of, a, of starting another invasion that we could go, helicopters in Saigon, helicopters in Kabul, no, we're not going to do helicopters there too. Fuck that. You know, I, I, I think the lesson of of the failure in that sense is being learned, uh, and and I do believe that if nothing else, uh, just we are always capable as libertarians uh, of pointing out things, shitty things that government does that most people don't know about. We're good at that, right? And Go just ahead. pointing those out. Just we don't think of it as education, but it is. And the thing of okay. education a little more broadly is part of what we do as activists. We want factual information in people's heads that isn't there. Yeah. We want them to know the true history of the government. We want them to know about COINTELPRO and Operation Mockingbird and you know all of those things in the history of war and false flags and war crimes and the formation of the military industrial complex post World War II is essential to understanding its power today. And I, I don't think you have to make it that complicated for the average American to go, yeah, war is a racket. And really, yeah, militarism is a racket too, isn't it? Oh, yeah, but tr try and get somebody to read Smedley Butler. Try and get somebody to read, period. Don't get, you don't have to get them to read it. You just don't get, I, I, I get your point, Ed, but I'm, I, I, I have chosen to adopt what I think is a more practical, optimistic, positive goal oriented framework for my activism, because I believe that our progress to a voluntary society is inevitable. And I want to do a better job with this show editorially of in my coverage of the daily news, pointing out why I believe that because a lot of people in the audience don't share that faith that I have. I think it's a rational faith that is a matter of of reason, logic, observation, deduction, and you go, yeah, and except for aliens or you know a, a real pandemic, the achievement of a voluntary society is inevitable for humanity. So are aliens. So we're, we're going to meet aliens eventually too. What's this? <laughs> Throwing your hands in the air and claiming you can't possibly educate the dummies of the world is exactly what the government wants you to do. I disagree fully. The government wants you to shut the fuck up. Yeah, that's Jim is saying that throwing your hands in the air is shutting up as opposed I'm to engaging. Throwing my them. hands in the air. I am utilizing my abilities and what I have to offer where I know it will be accepted and used rather than you know blanketing the masses and going for the odds. That's okay, the boomer libertarian. 
Okay, you know, you boomer said libertarian. I'm pretty sure you're expressing some unnecessary resignation. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly with Ed that we really need to start reaching out to these children. Like watching these kids uh, uh, walking around the school hallways in their masks, doing what they're told, being obedient. That terrifies the hell out of me. Like there really needs to be. And I think Young Americans for Liberty might be a group. For, you know, for instance, that, that does like there's groups out there that are focused on, you know, hyper focused on the youth. And we need more of those groups. I agree. Is is that your role? I can't say I agree with that. Like, I don't know if, if, if that's where libertarian big brothers and big sisters. Absolutely. Uh, but I don't I don't know that that's I, I mean, I get the premises of focus on the youth educate the next generation to be more libertarian or whatever. Be more but free I think, thinking, not even right, more right, libertarian. Sure, 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 sure. But even, even in that realm, I, I think there the opportunity for pushing as activists is, is in promoting homeschooling and unschooling, like the Ron Paul curriculum. I think there should be more versions of that, more comprehensive services and programs and, and, and you know, unschooling, homeschooling, remote learning programs, and that there's an opportunity for that. But when it comes to, like, ideologically fighting the tide of government education bullshit. I think it, it might be a losing battle. I don't want to get sidebarred on this. We got 15 minutes left and it's been fun. Keep the comments coming. Let's keep an eye. If we have any more veterans who want to call in, man, our callers today have been awesome. Totally. We've got just about 10 minutes left for callers. I'm going to breeze through headlines until Joey waves at me or we see it in the producer's club. John Smith on YouTube says my kids go to school saying it is the prison and they kick and scream on the way. And when dropped off, <laughs> Kids say the darndest things. So they... My school is a prison. Oh. Yeah. Fuck yeah, it is. All right. From AP News to our COVID blog, sources, U.S. to recommend COVID vaccine boosters at eight months. What? Told you so. The shit. Eight months. U.S. health experts are expected to recommend COVID-19 vaccine boosters for all Americans, regardless of age, eight months after they receive their second dose of the shot to ensure lasting protection against the coronavirus as the Delta variant spreads across the from Bloomberg via Yahoo, one virus case puts New Zealand into nationwide lockdown. Yeah. Yeah. That is the level of hysteria in some places. Uh, you think about some of the worst places in the United States that you might know from the news, like New York or L.A., where there is uh, some really horrific shit going on with COVID policy. And then imagine that in, in a smaller country. Well, New Zealand's one of them where the hysteria is top notch. New Zealand Prime Minister Yakinda Ardern put the nation into a three day lockdown after the discovery of the first community case of COVID 19 since February. The SNAP lockdown. It's not just a regular lockdown, it's a SNAP lockdown. We'll begin at midnight tonight as authorities rush to identify the source of a single infection in the largest city, Auckland, Ardern said at a news conference Tuesday in Wellington. Well, Genome sequencing is yet to be completed. The case is assumed to be the highly infectious Delta variant, she said. Well, we assume things are as bad as possible because that means we get to do as much shit as possible and take on as much power as possible, obviously. Yeah. Crazy. Crazy. Then they're going away with this. So I feel like every COVID block that we do now is like stupid shit government is doing, stupid shit pharmaceuticals getting away with, and then economic fallout. So here's some economic fallout. Well, first... Healthy disrespect on YouTube says, time to go back to looking to <laughs> All right, so this headline from thehill.com. September unemployment cliff looms for 7 million Americans. And there are a lot of people who are just like, oh, take advantage of this. And they have become dependent in many ways, whether they like it or not. That's, that's kind of how dependency works. And there are a lot of people who wouldn't have survived without these benefits. More than 7 million Americans are set to lose their unemployment aid immediately after Labor Day. Get back to work, motherfuckers day, even as the Delta variant poses new challenges to the economic recovery. Did I say motherfuckers? I meant to say wage slave peon citizens, excuse me. This is a family-oriented program, after all. Gig workers and other unemployed Americans receiving aid through programs created for the pandemic will see those checks end on September 7, along with the 300 weekly federal supplement to the traditional jobless benefits. Related economic dynamic in this headline from the AP, rural population losses add to farm and ranch 
labor shortage. This is the kind of story I'd love to pick apart. This is the kind of stuff that gives me, you know, you know, economics, nerdy, warm, fuzzy feeling inside. Uh, because I, I'm very concerned. I, I don't say I'm very concerned. One of the things that I think I'm, I'm uniquely present to uh, among libertarians is the drive to urbanization. And I'm, I'm not the only one. But that, you know, humans aren't supposed to live packed in like New York City. But if it wasn't for the, you know, and they wouldn't if it wasn't for the fountain of money known as the Federal Reserve in the middle of that. And then every little fountain that is, you know, attached to that. So um, rural population losses add to farm and ranch labor shortage. A lot of intersections with this, with COVID and with the employment crisis right now, uh, the unemployment crisis, excuse me, right? And the general labor shortage that's coming because the benefits have basically been too good. And part of what I fear is that we are going to be set up for uh, a universal basic income or, or some much heavier handed uh, welfare state program and I see the giant numbers flying around DC and all the silly proposals, $2,000 a month, this many trillions of dollars, whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, but I'm, I'm kind of hopeful that there might be a, a sort of peaceful economic collapse of the dollar. Uh, since we have Bitcoin, we have the ability to transition without uh, some of the worst inflationary collapses that we've seen in modern history, like you know, Weimar Republic and, and uh, Brazil, South Africa, Venezuela now, shit. Um, anyway, one last story in our COVID blog before we have, we have just enough time. I'm going to, Hey, we have one, we have a caller on the line. We're going to get to our caller. I'm going to skim the last of these headlines really quick. One last one in our COVID blog, Erica Badu cops to inconsiderate behavior at Barack Obama's birthday party. Days after Obama celebrated his 60th birthday, Erica Badu is publicly apologizing for being so inconsiderate. At the 44th President's Celebrity Set at Soiree in Martha's Vineyard. Wow. In a now deleted video, the singer songwriter posted on her Instagram story Obama could be seen busting a move on the dance floor alongside singer Her. The clip quickly went viral with many criticizing party attendees for not wearing masks. Really, Erica Badu, how dare you? How inconsiderate for you to expose your friend Barack Obama as the horrendously hypocritical asshole that he really is? How dare you? I'm so glad that you found it in you to. Humble yourself and apologize. A um, couple quick fun marijuana headlines. Gallup.com. More Americans have tried marijuana uh, than ever before. The headline is nearly half of U.S. adults have tried marijuana. Creeping up. And another one, and this is kind of disappointing for me, maybe for you too, Joey. Studyfinds.org. Working out high. More people are turning to marijuana while exercising during pandemic. I thought I was special with lit and fit shit. No, everybody's getting high yeah. to go to the gym. They, everybody's yeah. been getting high and then going to the gym. We're just allowed to talk about it. Now. Maybe that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So they, this is for a serious poll. 1,004 people who admit to using cannabis when exercising. Conducted by Fit Rated. Shows that 41.5% said they're consuming more. Anyway, this is it's fluctuated a little bit around COVID. I, that's not the important part of the story. The important part of the story, I think, is, is, is you're right, Joey, that now that people are comfortable enough to violate federal fucking law, or at least talk about it, answering a phone uh, with an anonymous survey questioner, uh, they get to say, yeah, they, they get to put numbers on this. And uh, one of the interesting splits in cannabis usage so a lot of it is CBD post workout, THC pre and during workout. Yeah, yeah, you, know, yeah. you can do both, uh, but CBD being the healing side of things yeah, from, from yeah, cannabis, yeah. anti-inflammatory, yes, yeah. uh, and THC being more the psychological stimulant. And it's funny. Some people say they're lazier working out on THC. Some people say they work out harder. Yeah, um, yeah. But the the number for um, this is is really interesting. I want to get to the critical numbers here. Overall, uh, so forty five percent of respondents use both CBD and THC. Twenty nine percent only use THC, and twenty six percent use CBD. Uh, most CBD users do it post workout. Seventy one point one percent. And one of the funny things that were pointed out is that people, these people, are spending more money on their cannabis habit and their gym memberships. Yeah, the gym. That's yeah. good. That's a good well, thing. I think you think of these 
topicals too. Like you, you got you got pain creams and stuff. All right, hold on. We got to get to our caller. Hell, you disrespect YouTube sucking on weed lollies while on the treadmill. It's a great nice. idea. Subtle. Or vape pens it's in the gym. Yeah, DNYUC small towns grow desperate for water in California. There's a guy charging five dollars for a shower there at a uh, Seagull Inn. Interesting. But fun related good news, studyfinds.org. Device makes seawater drinkable in minutes, possibly solving world's freshwater shortage. So we had a water block. And then it goes to the NSA. Why does the NSA want to keep its water usage a secret? That headline at wire.com. The National Security Agency has many secrets. But here's the new one. The agency is refusing to say how much water it's pumping into the brand new data center it operates in Bluffdale, Utah. According to the NSA, it's water usage is a matter of national security. That's cool follow-up link. Someone put this together in our producers club for me. Only in your state.com. The Utah data center covers more than 1 million square feet and it holds a massive amount of info. Dig into those more. T.me slash Adam versus the man. Good news in crypto from Bloomberg at Yahoo. Crypto market retakes $2 trillion market cap amid Bitcoin gains. Inputmag.com. And this is a scary one. I'm sharing this with you. This is our in internet block. Amazon will monitor workers' keystrokes to combat data theft. The company defends the decision, citing instances when hackers or imposters might have accessed a worker's account to steal customer information. Now, hypothetically, technology is great here, right? Empowering for an employer to have accountability for their employees. I totally support that. Scary thing is here is going to be used. A lot more than that. And you go, ah, oh, shit. It's just a reminder as to how much the authorities can hack into your machines. You got to assume when I say that none of your digital communications are secure, I assume that when I make notes on my phone, on my notepad, that uh, and they're getting a bit pinged or backed up. It could be just, even if it was secure, keystrokes perhaps could be spied on. The U.S. Sun hack warning, and this is again, practical story to put in the back of your head. T-Mobile probes huge data breach. As hackers claim they have names and social security numbers of 100 million customers. How many stories like this have you missed that were relevant to you? I'm a veteran. The VA has been hacked so many times, my social security number might as well be fucking public. I don't care. But you have to take the same awareness into anything about you that is digitized and accept a certain lack of privacy as the digital reality that we live in. Uh, that's it for we got two, we got two other stories we'll get to later. Let's get to our caller. We got just a few minutes to talk to Mike Freeman. Mike, welcome to the show today. How you doing, brother? Hey, what's going on, man? Been following you for always a while. Good yeah, it's always good to chat with you. Finally, get to talk to you live in person, man. I'm sorry you got to see this face, but you know I grew up with it. What can you do? So it's a powerful mustache. What? It's a powerful mustache. <laughs> Beard mustache. Uh, it's, to, it's to hide the ugly. Do you, do you have a connection? Ugly, you know. do, you, do you have a connection to the uh, <laughs> to, to the militarism you wanted to weigh in on today? Man, it's getting really choppy here. Let me see if I can. Do you have a connection to militarism or the end of the war in Afghanistan you wanted to weigh in on? Uh oh, do we lose Mike? Oh, we're losing him. Oh, no. We're about out of time oh. anyway. Mike, get a better connection. Call in tomorrow or later this week. Uh, we'll be taking calls on the, uh, the on the end of the war in Afghanistan, especially from veterans, all week this week. Keep doing it. So uh, it's been a lot of fun today. Really appreciate all the callers. Um, was I going to say something else important? I don't know. Jim, give us the producer notes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Mike. Uh, your connection was bad. Hopefully he calls in tomorrow for doing them all week. That would be awesome. T.me forward slash Adam versus the man is where you can find all the links that we talked about the show today at patreon.com forward slash Adam versus the man Instagram at the garden of freedom homefront battle buddies.com the crypto the number six.com go green energy online.com click all the websites click all the buttons on all the websites do them in any order you want today. Love you all have a good day. All right, Ed, you've got 20 seconds for final thoughts sir. Smoke weed every day. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, sir. Ed Vallejo in the coast seat today from goodnewsnetwork.org. Oh, wait. Super chat. Mike Freeman. Ed's a damn handsome man. Yeah. Did you know every, yeah. Single, every single man we had on, actually, every single person we had 
visually on screen today. The beard guy. Pretty good facial hair. It's a good day for facial hair. Uh, so goodnewsnetwork.org on this day in history, August 17th. It was on this day in 1945 that Indonesia, you remember Indonesia, declared its independence from Bueller, Bueller, that's right, the Netherlands, but you knew that, right? Also on this day in 1978, the first balloon to cross the Atlantic Ocean, Double Eagle Two, landed near Paris, 137 hours after leaving Presque Isle, Maine. And with that, mwah, peace and love, y'all. Choose happiness and be excellent to each other. 